Thank you so much for choosing to come here today instead of going home at minus six outside. The reason for why we're here today is this is the second lecture as part of the program or the cooperation between Career Angels and Talentry, your career program. <coughs> the first lecture was last year in December. And after last year's lecture, we asked you, the participants, what would you like to hear about? So we collected your feedback and based on the feedback, we have prepared a series of lectures. Today we will talk about personal branding and between now and the end of June, we will also talk about salary negotiations, how to prepare a CV, we will have a lecture called Are you linked in or linked out? <coughs> so anything and everything you wanted to hear, we have prepared that for you. We have also decided to be innovative in 2019. We have Facebook online streaming on this camera over the Career Angels account and we have YouTube online streaming <coughs> over the Business Schools account. That material will, make, will be made available to you through your logged in accounts through Talentry. It will take a little while because we want to make sure that everybody can have access to the material in terms of we will add subtitles in when the lecture is in English, we will have subtitles in Polish and vice versa so that all international non-Polish speaker can also take advantage of, of the material that we have. You might have <coughs> noticed we have also uploaded career material to the Talentry website that is also both in Polish and English. If you see anything that's missing or see, well, there's, I would like to read more about this or that, just let us know, me or Olga, we make sure to make everything available to you. One of the <coughs> topics that you wanted to hear about is personal branding. And the reason why we are doing it as the first lecture is because it's one of the most important bits. Who heard about per who has already heard about personal branding? <coughs> okay, who has a personal branding strategy? Does he hear? Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> um, who heard about personal branding five years ago? Four years ago? Three? Okay. It is something like a buzzword, and if somebody had asked me five years ago or ten years ago, Sandra, you will be speaking of personal branding, I would have said, no, no, definitely not me. Because my background, for those who do not know me, I'm a recruiter, an ex-recruiter. I started recruiting uh, for Central and Eastern Europe in Budapest, 2002, so that seems 17 years ago. And being a recruiter, one of the things that you notice very quickly is that candidates have what I call multiple personality disorder. And I will explain. As a recruiter back then, when I was very junior, I would receive a CV and would have a first impression of a candidate. I would think, oh wow, what an amazing candidate. Or I would go, oh, there are five spelling mistakes and the margins are not correct here. I would have some kind of already an assumption, whether it was completely involuntary, that was like, you, know, you have an impression. So I would have a CV personality. Then I would call that person, and depending on how I called that person, I would then have a telephone conversation, personality. And then I would invite the person into the office for an in-person interview, and I would have an in-person or an interview personality. And then I would send some of my candidates to my clients and would get feedback from them. And that would have sometimes a different client feedback personality. And then a couple of years later, LinkedIn was founded. And then we have a LinkedIn profile personality. And the thing is, um, up until, and if you had asked me five years ago, so what do you think about personal branding? I would have said this is a marketing buzzword, it's not important. But the data shows us that personal branding is something that is, has a bigger and bigger influence on the success of candidates on the job market. And I'll get to that in a bit. So I started as a recruiter almost 17 years ago. I worked in recruitment. 
I selected candidates to be then presented to my clients. I would naturally help them in their interview preparation and CV preparation because nobody told me that a headhunt is not supposed to do that. But that was my favorite part of the job. And then I had a, my second career. I worked in sales and marketing. And after, and I worked in sales and marketing in Latin America, which makes it even more exotic. But I had a very thorough US American, because it was a US American company, very thorough sales and marketing training. Moved back to Europe, and <coughs> I'm originally from Austria. That's why also, that's, what, that's the reason why the lecture is in English. It's not because I'm Polish and I don't want to lecture in Polish. English is much easier for me to, to communicate in. So I wanted to move back to Europe and I actually wanted to move to Poland because my grandma is from Poland and that was the reason for me to, to, come, to come here. And funnily enough, my boss from Budapest was looking for somebody in the Warsaw office. So that was perfect timing. I recruited in Poland for Poland and Central Eastern Europe. Feel free to come in. There are still... I don't know to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> um, so I recruited on the Polish market and I started using my know-how from sales and marketing. Good evening. Feel free to join us. Um, and because I used not only what I knew from recruitment but also from sales and marketing, my advice to candidates started to be even more effective than when I did it as a junior. And then very slowly, my helping candidates became more and more time absorbing. And by 2010, I said, well, maybe there is, maybe somebody would pay for that. And that's how Career Angels got started. Career Angels is now a company of 15 people. We support experienced managers and executives across Europe. 40% of our clients are in Poland, 60% are outside Poland, the majority is somewhere in Europe. 70% of board level or board minus one, either the local board or an international board. And one thing I quickly realized, especially over the last couple of years, is that the market changes. Now, question to you, who, who would say, who would agree with me that the job market from 2010 and now 2019, that the job markets are different? Okay, who would say that the job market from 2012 versus 2019 is different? 2015? 17? 18? Okay. <laughs> the job market changes. And one of the things that I quickly realized um, is that we live in a VUCA world, a VUCA market. For those who have not heard VUCA yet, who is familiar with VUCA? Good. What does the V stand for? Volatile. Volatile. U is for? Close, uncertain. Almost <coughs> complex and ambiguous. Close enough. That acronym comes from the 90s and was coined by the US American military to describe Cold War. They did not ever before had Cold War before and it was super difficult to come up with a strategy to predict the, the enemy. So VUCA was the acronym to describe a war scenario, a war atmosphere, and back then. And that's how the market and the job market can be described. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. What does that mean? Um, a couple of weeks ago, I calculated exactly how many years of experience the career consultants at Career Angels have. In our team of career consultants, we have over 108 years of experience together. 
But the thing is, because exactly of that VUCA, our experience to a certain extent, our intuition, doesn't help us. Because the career, things we thought we knew about the job market and the career advice I would give my candidates in 2002 or 2003 or even 2010 versus the career advice I should be giving now, sometimes are even contradicting because it has changed so much. Um, when somebody shares with you career tips, I am sure everybody does it with their best intentions at hand. Our friends, family, HR people, recruiters, etc., they really want to help. But usually they repeat advice that they have been giving since the 90s or since 2010 or 2015, not realizing how much the market has changed. So what we started doing um, starting in 2012, we collect data. We collect data on what works, what doesn't work, what is the most effective job hunting channel, what works on LinkedIn, what works on CVs. We have KPIs and that kind of data we collect, we analyze and based on that we then formulate career advice, career strategies. And that's what I want to share with you. And one of the things that has come out of the data, especially when comparing um, the job market in Poland to Western European countries, is that personal branding is one of the key things that, to put, simply can make or break a career. And I can give you examples today. Fantastic. Do you have any particular wishes for today? Anything particular? Questions that you have or something you want to see answered? At the end. At the end, good. Um, somebody asked how long I'm planning to stay here or talk for. I want this to be interactive, so if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. If you want to point out to something very specific, I'm connected to LinkedIn and the internet, so we can actually do it real case things. I will show you. Um, based on a real person, how branding, how, how powerful branding can be as from a candidate perspective. So we'll be here for until um, about 7.30 and I'll stay there for, for the Q&A session. For the q and I'm more than happy to switch off the streaming and we can have a, for those who are a little bit camera shy, uh, can then have a more open conversation. Good. Um, one of the statistics that those are my most favorite statistics is how which job hunting channels are the most effective ones. In other words, what is the channel that works for C level and C minus one when it comes to looking for a job? Usually when I ask, well, is it applying directly to somebody? Is it networking, executive search firms or job ads? The majority normally would say, well, it's definitely networking. This is what works the most. But that's why, and intuitively, I would have said the same, but I have the data that definitely shows that the channel that is the most effective one, as we saw in detail in the first lecture, is speculative introduction, meaning contacting your personal, your potential boss directly. And then you would say, what do you mean? I'm a CFO, I can't send my CV to a CEO. Or I'm the CEO of Poland. I c who do you want me to send a C CV to the CEO of Europe? And I would then say, yes, of course. If that is your potential boss, then that works. And here, even more than the other channels, the branding, how you, pro how you position yourself as a candidate, that's what will make the application successful or not. Um, data also shows us other trends. For example, it shows us that more projects at sea level, uh, that there are more projects at sea level prior to the probation period than ever before. That did not happen. It started about three years ago um, when a candidate, sea level candidate, applies to the potential boss. They are much more probable to be offered to first work on a project and then be invited to come on board on a probation period. That's one of the things that data shows us. Data also shows us that, there are, that there's more and more technology in the interviewing process at, this, at, 
at sea level. You would say, okay, I know for the junior candidates, you have recruitment games, I know that. But do you really use technology at the sea level? Yes. We have more and more candidates that receive in invitations to pre-recorded interviews. What does that mean? You as an experienced candidate, not a student, not an intern, not a graduate program. For CFO, CEO, marketing position, you name it, you get a link to a pre-recorded interview. You click on Tuesday at 10, and then you listen to pre-recorded questions. Somebody says, well, please, could you please introduce yourself? And you record your answer. And some softwares allow you to re record your answer and some say well that was one shot next question so if somebody's very picky the a 30 minute interview then turns into a four hour interview because you want to keep improving your answers now the thing here is that who listens to that to your answers who who decides whether you whether you continue in the recruitment process Artificial intelligence. So your recorded replies at a sea level are evaluated and analyzed first by a machine. And the machine decides how likely it is that you told the truth or that you lied, how confident you are, how positive, etc., etc. And AI then recommends the top 10 or top 15 or top 20 candidates. And then HR looks at it. That would have been impossible five years ago, but it's already started. Another thing, when we look at technology, um, there is a software that takes over scheduling interviews by email with candidates, and it won't even know that you've been emailing with, an, with a robot. Fantastic. One thing that we've also seen when it comes to trends, that the overall average Salaries for CEOs have decreased over the, over the last three years and that the job market has become more competitive, which means that little details have become more and more important. What, when, you, when I say personal branding, I'll start with what I do not mean. I don't mean PR, I do not mean pseudo experts, gurus on Facebook or LinkedIn or not somebody who has to post every day, oh, I've had a fantastic day, I've just run five kilometers or something. That's not personal branding for me. Now the question, and I'm interested to see how you understand personal branding. Could you please write down your definitions of personal branding? Right now, I'll give you a minute. If you need a piece of paper, let me know. I still have here some. I know I'm not supposed to walk out of the recording. Do you need a pen? Okay. Anybody needs a pen? Me. Who has an extra pen? Okay, your colleague and in the back, do you have one? Okay, anybody else missing a pen? Uh, here, may I? Richard is lending you his pen. Oh. Great. So please write down your definition of personal branding.
So, who would like to share? You would like to share, Richard. Well, for me, it's very simple. It's just building a brand of myself. Okay. <laughs> who has a different definition? Yes? Okay, so we had brand of myself. Your keywords were what? Image, quality. Yes, it doesn't work. Quality in a certain area. Who else? Yes? Maybe it's not a definition, but uh, a key feature of a good personal brand. I think it's being consistent and authentic uh, across all platforms. So assuming that I try to build my brand uh, on many uh, different platforms. Because nowadays, uh, as you mentioned, AI can uh, check it uh, in no time that I'm not uh, consistent. Even. AI is one thing, but even a person who is a little bit motivated and has 15 minutes to look about, look up information on you, yes, they will find it out. What else? I would say it's uh, maybe like virtual name card. Mm -hmm. In your car, you can say it's something like that. Okay. I would say that it's influencing on how others perceive you in the exactly intended plan and executed way and doing it to serve your uh, business or professional purpose. Okay, anything else? I think this is the way uh, people see you, your skills, and the way to, to manage uh, you know, how you look to, to others. And I mean specifically uh, co-workers, business partners, your boss. Okay, and that depending on who they is. Yeah. Okay, it can be voters. If we talk about politics, it can be whatever we then define. Yes. Good. When I talk about personal branding, I'm looking at the last 17 years of recruiting people. I would say it's everything. It is not LinkedIn. It is not how we dress. It's not. It's really everything. It is what we say, we do, and we write. And ideally, and I like what you said, with to be aware of it, to do it with purpose, and to be consistent about it, to have an intention behind it, to know how are you perceived, is that how you want to be perceived, um, and to influence that actively. Now, what we will do, given how many of you have come today, we will not do it in big groups. Um, but we will do it per row. If you could, I'll give you 12 minutes. If you could please come up with, imagine that you have to assess candidates and their personal brand. I mean, everything is a lot, but still we can come up with, what are the, how do you define everything? So how do you define everything? How would you define criteria to assess personal brand? And once you have that, come up with three examples of good personal branding and three examples of bad personal branding. Questions? No questions, good. I'll give you 12 minutes and in rows, work together. Um, you have paper, if you need pens, whatever, just let me know. Good? Fantastic, let's get started. 12 minutes. So for sure this inconsistency. Want to join the girls? Where are you? Uh,
brand so that you can then assess a personal brand of somebody. What have you come up with? Well, uh, for us, uh, trustworthiness was uh, number one, that you can trust somebody. But he's not a fraud. I mean, he didn't lie. But how do you know? How word, do you check word it? Word of mouth. <laughs> word of mouth. So reputation. That's good. Reputation is good. Well, uh, actually... We uh, very important is good balance, good balance of everything, not too much, not too little. Of what? Of everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm interested, what does everything mean? Uh, well, it's a difficult question. <laughs> good. What else? What are the criteria have you come it, up with? It's strictly connected with, you, with what you say about the personal branding, that it's everything. Yes, but now I want to go deeper and say, what is everything? Yeah, 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 I understand. <laughs> yeah. Achievements. Yes. Body language. Very good. Yes. Personal network. Network, very good. What else? Integrity and consistency. Yes, what else? Education. Education? Like the white meaning. No, circle. Well, wait, wait, wait. I, I want to explore that. Because we discussed uh, that this is kind of a top point, kind of. Um, and, um, level of competence, level of expertise yeah, yeah, in the field. Yeah, Very good. Yeah. Hold on. How unique somebody is? Yes. Yes, and? Level of being engaged. Uh, we were thinking about like, during the interview, for example, that you are talking with somebody and you see how much this person is engaged into it. How would you call that criteria engagement? It could be that. But uh, what if. But we also think that it's, that somebody's like positive, open, and, and engaged. Like, it could be attitude as well. What if you don't need somebody like that? I'm, I'm not. someone who's engaged in something I don't interested really. in him, engagement is important, it doesn't matter what it is. I don't believe that you don't need somebody who is engaged. Really? Well, in what? <laughs> exactly. So uh, I'm looking for the overall criteria because there is levels. Some you might want somebody who is engaged at level 10, and some you say, well, if it's a three, that's enough. But how would you call the the above criteria? That's can you attitude? Attitude. Hmm. Maybe let's circle back to that later. What else? Suitability. Hmm? Suitability. Suitability. If it was from a job perspective, yes. Then we look at competencies, soft maybe soft and hard skills. Here. Any other criteria that you have? Self-awareness. Self-awareness, yes. It's a buzzword now. <laughs> How do you know it? When is when somebody is self-aware? <laughs> For example, if during the interview asked somebody what are your weaknesses and strengths, then they actually have a good answer to that. And an accurate answer. Then know if somebody's self-aware or not. But how, how do you judge that? 
I think that's something that everybody this prepares is for, for a different lecture. <laughs> this is for a different lecture where we talk about so that question. So what's a perfect answer for a question, what's your weak site? Okay, we can talk about that in the Q&A, okay? okay? Or in the next lecture about interviews and salary negotiations. <laughs> what other criteria? Not what showing off. Uh, recommendations. Other yes, that we have. Classes. So we have reputation, consistency, yeah, yeah. body language, network. Self-confidence. What if you don't need somebody with self -talk? Have we mentioned if you stand out against other Uniqueness. Right, okay. So that but then not everybody wants to stand out. I would say uh, maybe a general, general uh, good person image. Like, uh, you know, a work, image. Work life balance and things like that. What about stress? So it's language, yes, it can be. We have that. And it also adds profitability. I mean, not necessarily financially, but uh, does it, does, so does this personal brand uh, serve your purpose? Does it bring you profit? that you intended to do? Um, which means, is it in line with your strategy? So you need to have a strategy. Good. Good. Okay. We'll circle back to that. Um, we, it took us three years to come up with criteria that work for our clients, meaning for our candidates that are looking for jobs. So we will go today through the criteria that we have defined and we'll show you how we see the levels and how you can audit it for yourselves. But I'll circle back to that in a bit. Can you give examples of good personal brand? Good or bad? Good, good personal branding. Any examples? Do you have any people that you would say they have good personal brands? Our Prime Minister? Good or bad? <laughs> okay, but, but let's talk politics. Um, who would say that Donald Trump has a good personal brand? Who would say he has a bad personal brand? <laughs> who would say he has both? <laughs> okay, let's see, no, but I'm really interested. Who would say he has a bad personal brand? Who would say he has a good personal brand? First I ask for good, it doesn't matter. It, the, the, the ideas is, are split. The thing is, um, when I did this lecture a couple of months ago, I asked the same question actually. The participants came up with Donald Trump and one group put him into good example and one group put him into bad example. Now the thing is, they put him in a bad as a bad example because he's so inconsistent. But the thing is, he's consistently inconsistent. You can predict that he will be inconsistent. And this is how he has built up all his entire brand. Yes, so from a branding yes. perspective, it's brilliant. It doesn't mean that I agree with him or his politics, but he would be a good example. <laughs> it depends what's important for you. For him. <laughs> for him. Yeah. For him. Exactly. Works for him. But you know, it depends on whether he's president. Do he does that? it on purpose or not? I'm pretty sure he does it on yeah, purpose. Pretty sure. Um, other examples, if you think good or bad. Good or bad. Until a certain point, true. Okay, who else? Still Where? Now in the middle. Musk. Well, let me put it, and I'm quoting that, that that's not something I said. Um, but uh, somebody else in a previous lecture said Musk, unless he has hi he's high and he tweets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as long as he knows what he's doing, he is good, but then he has these moments where he has a bad breath. And we, when we hear uh, a name, Obama, Michelle Obama, we have immediate associations with them. So when somebody says Monica, 
her colleagues at the studies have immediate associations with her or with Richard, etc. So these associations, as you said, it's, a, it's how we are perceived and ideally we are perceived in a way that we want to be perceived. And that's what we want to get to. Because the anti-examples, especially when managing your career, is to suffer from the multiple personality disorder. And because there are more candidates nowadays than ever before, because it is a mature market, inconsistencies influence the recruitment process and the success of the recruitment process immensely. I can give you an example of also inconsistent behavior. True story, I have three CEO clients. When you look at their level of competence, I would say they are, they are almost equal. And all three of them would make it onto a short list. Now, <clears throat> I'll describe how they are in terms of interaction. CEO number one is somebody, when they walk in the room, and even if everybody's busy talking, when that person walks in the room, you feel their presence. That person, it's a lady, she has charisma, she has presence. You walk in and she's like, oh, I want to talk to her. She makes this impression, like this elegant businesswoman that has this, this aura of competence around her and she, she's just elegant and she's amazing. When you look at her, that's what you feel from her. When you talk to her, she's always well prepared, well prepared very eloquent, well-spoken, etc. But when emailing, she is not aware of the fact that she comes across, oh, that this is being streamed, right? I need to find another word. Um, <laughs> she comes across as somebody abrupt, impolite. In English, the word would be beep, beep. But she doesn't know. So in person, she's amazing, but over email, you want to kill her. And it doesn't matter if she talks to somebody, to a recruiter, to somebody else. But from a competence point of view, in person, great, a great presence. CEO number two, um, competent, very friendly, easy going. But for some reason, until he met us, he would write all his emails and SMS in caps lock. <laughs> with spelling mistakes. And it took us, and this is no joke, it took us six months to convince him to stop writing in caps lock. <laughs> <laughs> and this is from like two years ago. This is not from 10, 15 years ago. This is recent. And then um, CEO number three, an absolute gentleman. Doesn't have the presence. You would probably, when he comes in, you wouldn't probably even notice him. He'd start talking to you and you'd think he's, just a random guy, super relatable, and I can assure you, if you exchange business cards with him the next day, he will send you an email saying, listen, you know what, it was a pleasure meeting you, not just a blah blah, but he will remember about the, the names of your kids, and really, he connects with people. After every interaction, after every Skype call, he sends a thank you email, but it's one that is not just a BS thank you email, but one that has a meaning behind it, that you can feel this is, he actually says thank you. Now imagine you're the recruiter and you have three of those candidates, all are equally competent. Who would you recommend? The third one. In theory, that's, that's a clear choice. And now the thing is, candidate number one, CEO number one and CEO number two are equally competent, but they are not aware of how they are perceived or what it means when they write caps lock SMS. He stopped doing it, and that's <laughs> but those are the little things. Um, when somebody is experienced and is aware, there is a lot of self-awareness and the interview process is long. I mean, there are people who are very good at playing a certain role. Now, I know of an interview technique that I'm an absolute fan of um, in terms of I, I like the idea. There is a CEO uh, on a European level who invites his shortlisted candidates to a final lunch. Now he pays the waiter 
to screw up the order of the candidates. Because he wants to see who they really are. Not who they pretended to be, and they could be consistent across all channels and have a personal perfect brand and very aware and consistent. But then they, the person pays the waiter because they want to see who they really are um, when there's a screw up. Now the thing is, some might say, well, it's obvious they need somebody who is very kind, but maybe he needs somebody who screams at a waiter. You don't know that. But it's about the consistency to say, are they the same person that they pretended to be up until that? And now a case that I want to show you, um, real case, is somebody who used to be an officer at an NGO and said, I want to go into innovative HR. Now, when we look at cases um, of let's say career plans, we always look at, at career angels, how is that a standard level of job search and next steps, is it medium level of complexity or is it a difficult level of complexity? Standard means you're looking for something that you have experience in, you have competences and it's of your interest. So a CFO looks for the next CFO job. Mm -hmm. Medium, you're looking for a job in line with the competencies outside your key industry. That would be CFO who has never worked in production and he now wants to get into production. Difficult, you're looking for a job that is outside your core experience and industry. It is possible but requires planning. So to be sure that we are on the same page, let's look at some examples. Let's imagine that um, the person we're talking about has a master in science in electronics and medical science, has spent one year in the medical industry right out of graduation in the early 90s and then worked for 20 years in the telecom industry. When we met him, he was a sales and business unit director and he said, I want to work in the medical industry. I want to be a sales engineer. Would you tell that person, oh, this is easy, that, that's a standard search process? Is it medium or difficult? Who would say it's difficult? Who would say it's medium? Who would say it's standard? Okay, for those who said that it's medium, why medium? Just experience in sales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And medical. he has some experience in medical. Not at all, but some okay. Good. Now imagine all those who said medium, my arguments for why it's not medium but difficult. Imagine that somebody comes to you and says, listen, I have been making 35,000 slotty per month and my team size is, depending on the year, between 200 and 500 people. But I don't want that anymore. Now I don't want to have a team and I want to make between 8 and 12,000 slotty. And I don't want to have your job and I don't want to have any promotions for the next two to three years. Who would believe that? I'm not asking about the competencies, but I'm asking, is it realistic for that person to make such a big jump and change from high level, well-making money, managerial position to specialist and making tw about 20% of the current salary? Can we now agree that it's difficult? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Again, but you need to find somebody who believes in, in that. Now, what about master in science and architecture, at that point doing uh, executive MBA studies, worked five years as an architect, is an architect, wants to be a startup consultant. Standard, medium, or difficult? Startup, what? Anything. Somebody who is not yet 30, so startup is a buzzword Medium. and they are in and not an IT architect but an interior architect who would say difficult medium standard okay Maybe it's even standard these days if you are a startup seek it's related to architecture <laughs> well, if it's related to architecture, then yes, but there are not so many startups in architecture. So without more information, you can't really say it's easy. It's definitely not standard, but probably somewhere between medium and difficult. 
Um, after five years of studies, that person is not yet 30, currently doing the MBA, can use that, the project to, it's, it's not medium, I'd say it's not standard, neither standard nor difficult, I'd say this is more or less medium. Let's jump to the next one. We have real case Astrid. Have a look at her, please. So, and you now saw the CV as long as a recruiter would take time to read a CV. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's so long. I gave you, I gave you in total now 14 seconds to read a CV. This is usually how much time a recruiter would spend on your CV. Now, summarizing, she has an MA in international relations at the time was doing international MBA studies has five years of experience in, a, in the humanitarian sector in China, Panama, Thailand, Switzerland, Tunisia, Greece, Botswana, Malawi, Hong Kong, is an associate program officer and wants to go into innovative HR in Norway. Is that standard, medium, or difficult? Difficult. Difficult? Medium? <laughs> I like your positive attitude. <laughs> I will not ask about standard. Now tell me, between the CV and this description, what three words would you use her to describe? To describe her. International, somebody remembered born in 87, that's what you saw. Let's go back. about you, take your CV, fold it in two, look at the first half page, because that's usually what they see when they open up your CV, and see what you just saw with her. And usually you're already used to your own CV, show that to somebody who doesn't know you well, your colleagues, your peers from the MBA studies, and say, What's the first three things that you see? How would you describe me based on that? And if the three words are what you want them to see and say about you, then your CV is good. But if not, that means we need to improve it. So, her perspective, she's label, labeled as a humanitarian, labeled NGO, difficult to rebrand, and at a point she was super frustrated. So what did we do? We said, we prepared a whole questionnaire, but the focus was what is your experience in HR? So what is the evidence, the competence that she can actually work in an HR role? What is her IT technology experience? And what is her innovation related experience? Because evidence is credibility. Then we also looked at the CV and the LinkedIn profile and we said the content has to be relevant and concrete for the target group. Her previous CV was, her, who was the target group of her first CV? Uh, NGOs. NGOs, exactly. But now she wants to play to corporations. The format and structure has to be perfect. Now, the more non-standard the job search is, the more perfect CV and LinkedIn have to be. Um, we have one tool that assesses the LinkedIn profile, the CV, and you get, say 35 out of 45 points. So we express it in, I don't know, 57%. And then some of our, some would then say to us, oh, but is it really that bad that I have two spelling mistakes? Or a margin to the left and then sometimes to the right, or that the text is not justified, that can't be that important. Now the thing is, 
if you are in the, on a mature market and there's a lot of competition, all these details, they influence the recruitment process because a recruiter, when the day of a, a standard day of a recruiter is get into the office, have about between five and 10 interviews and receive between 20 and 60 CVs per day, plus business development calls plus report writing. They have very high intensive days. So, and they have really a lot of candidates. It's not that when there is a job ad or when they source candidates and there are only five candidates. There are 50, 100 candidates, competent candidates. So the first, when they have to filter down the candidates, recruiters in the first couple of weeks of any recruitment process, they will look for reasons to exclude you from the recruitment process, not include you, exclusion. So what are easy reasons to exclude somebody? Not professional photo, oh, spelling mistakes. I know recruiters who will say executive search consultants, bad CV, bad candidate. Doesn't mean it's true but it's a good criteria or their, their good criteria to say, this is my selection of excluding candidates. I mean, it's good or bad or fair or something, but that's one way to go about it. <laughs> Some will say, oh, if they work in marketing and they don't have a personalized link to the LinkedIn profile, they don't know marketing. Out. As you say in Polish, so you want to make sure that they know and they apply all the rules to themselves. And some of you had already said it, we want to make sure that somebody, that when we talk about personal brand, that you are unique and the personality shows. So first step, the content has to be relevant and concrete to the target group. So here we said we want to make sure that we don't have words like mission or some kind of software that only the NGO market knows. We, we want to translate that into the corporate word, word words. Donor visits become, became events. Asylum seekers became end users, <laughs> etc., etc. Good. Then we looked at the formatted structure, and these are are then summarized in percentages. And we looked at personality and uniqueness, and this was the end result. <laughs> Same person. You can show the way. Uh, I mean, non standard, non -standard, standard CV, I would say. In her case, yes, because that's what we needed for her. But not everybody will need it. Mm -hmm. What is the result? <laughs> She got a job as an HR trainer in Netflix in Amsterdam. Wow. So not in Norway, but in a way. Which, satisfied. based on the feedback, I said no, it will never happen. But a Western European capital, yes. So we reworked the header, we reworked the summary to say what we want to say. We redid the education part, we added more credibility. So we turned something that was difficult into something that was a standard process, just because of branding. And obviously, to that is not just the CVs, then the interview preparation, etc., etc., to be consistent. So then the LinkedIn, etc., etc. So this is just one of the examples, and I can give you lots of other examples, how branding and thinking about how do I want to position myself as a candidate, how that fits, how that then can influence it. Let me show you, if you want to do that, how you can benchmark yourselves as well. Um, what's your role? University? No, uh, you work at the university. Yes. Oh, okay. Bad example. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
What about public sector? Mm, no. Difficult. What's your role? Director and What kind of director? Um, huh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, sales and vendor. Let's stick to sales director. In Warsaw? Yes. Good. So, location, Warsaw. So you compete against 9,140 candidates on, only on LinkedIn, plus the ones who are not on LinkedIn, plus the ones who are outside Warsaw who want to move back to Warsaw, who want to relocate to Warsaw. So when I say there are a lot of candidates, I see I now have to filter it down, but still it's usually more than a thousand candidates that you compete against. So if you want to have the benchmark, or if you want to get a little bit more depressed, want to get home, do the double check. Because you need to benchmark and say, who am I competing against? How unique do I have to be? If you position yourself correctly, then a good pool of competing candidates is about 100, 200. A question. Uh, yes. If a sales director and we see four, four names, actually, I, won, I know one of them. Why they are on the list? So why number one is number one, not another person? Mm -hmm. I would like to invite you to our lecture to on your LinkedIn or linked out in about two months. Because <laughs> then when we will discuss how do you make it to the top of the list here, it's because it's my first connections. That's why they're first. But on the other hand, I have a lot of first connections for sales directors. And we'll discuss that during another lecture because that goes deeper into how to fill out the profile to make sure to be in the first one, two, three research, uh, search results. Good. Continuing. With that gentleman, um, turned out that there was a story behind it and we made sure that the profile summary said that he reads industry magazines, he attends conferences, he then started a part-time job in a technical role in a technical company, and two international medical equipment companies said, I will interview you. One said, I don't buy your story, you are overqualified, and I'm sure you will want to have your boss's job in no time. And one company said, I believe you, and they hired him. And it worked. But there was a lot of effort in personal branding, and that was difficult, even with the personal branding. And it took him about one year to make the whole transition. Something but there is almost off here. What is off? Yeah. Ah, thank you. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we have worked now for three years on a personal branding model from a candidate's point of view. When you Google personal branding, you will find thousands of different models, depending on the company or the guru. So what we have come up with is this model, where we have eight criteria. You are the second ones to see it. It has not been yet published on the internet. And I want to walk you through that criteria, through all the criteria. So how we will go about that? How do you proceed? Number one, and here I recommend everyone to really take a piece of paper or your cell phone and start making notes, because I want to walk you through all the eight criteria so you know what to do next after today. The most important thing, and without that, we don't even go further with any of our clients, is to say, what's your goal? What's your goal in one year, two years, five years? In terms of career goal or financial goal, the more concrete you are, the better. If you don't know where you see yourself in three years, for the sake of this exercise, just pick one thing. So you see the mechanism later on. So on top of or wherever you are now in your notes, goal in three years, where do I want to be? 
If you want to make it five or ten years, make it five or ten years. You have that good if you're not sure pick something that you have been thinking about just for the sake of the exercise and now when we will look at the criteria the mechanism is the following at first ask yourself in order to achieve that role or once I'm in that role what level is required of me and I'll soon show you an example and then second question where am I today and usually there will be a discrepancy and that's the area that we know that we have to work on so let's start with competencies okay so um, does anybody want to volunteer as an example? Are you a board member, Magda? Uh, in NPOs, yes, but in my company. In okay, the... let's assume, I'll just, we do pretend, okay? Let's pretend that Magda wants to be by 2000. Let's say 21, 22, sales director on the board in an international <coughs> company at 40k base salary gross. Can we pretend that's your goal? No. no? <laughs> Can we pretend? <laughs> pretend. <laughs> just to have an example. <laughs> okay, let's just pretend. Not at a board, let's say it's a small company, but she says in three years, pick a company and board level. Now, on looking at the competencies, what we say from zero to five, and we have them defined here that five is mentor level salesperson versus one junior specialist where does she have to be in order to become a board member four, four to four. five probably even closer to five to be able to mentor and influence a sales team of 100 people good so this is the goal And then she at least right now has to be at a three, otherwise she wouldn't be at a managerial level. <clears throat> Maybe more, I don't know, I don't know her. So we see that there is a discrepancy. Now the next step would be, how do I get from three, how do I increase that? Good. So now over to you, think about your goals, Think about where you need to be in terms of competencies and where you're currently at and make a note. How can we improve competencies? If somebody says, okay, I see I need to improve, how can you improve competencies? Training courses. You can get involved in different projects. Internally, sometimes you can do projects externally, but I'm not saying changing companies, but 
and externally, for example, NGOs, some work to show that you have a certain competence. A relatively, and you, we said a lot is about perception. If that's something that can't wait three years but should happen in half a year, I highly recommend LinkedIn Learning, Udemy, and Coursera. Those are certificate courses you can do in a weekend, in a month, in a couple of months, and add them to your CV to show evidence that you have certain competencies, even if you already have them, but there's a difference between... Could you spell the third? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And Coursera, you can do um, courses and you get valid certificates, for example, from MIT or from Caltech or from the Buffalo University of New York. So really prestigious universities give people access to the courses. You do have to do homework and papers and projects. But it's something that you can obtain relatively easily at usually between 30 and 100 dollars and then add to your CV. Right. If you need to build certain credibility in an area. Good. Public speaking. Now when it comes to public speaking, um, studies show that public speaking is the skill that has the biggest influence on career success in terms of advancement. So, um, first think about where do you, how much of public speaking, how well of a public speaker do you have to be? And public speaking also includes presenting something to the board in a foreign language. Do you need that? If yes, something. So here we defined public speaking, level one would be no public speaking at all. Number two, we said this is somebody who speaks in public irregularly and does it has, let's say, average level of competence. If somebody does it regularly, we'd say they're good at public speaking. If somebody pays you to speak in public, it's usually because you're good. So level four, we said, is to be invited locally and that somebody pays for that. And number five in terms of public speaking is that you are invited internationally and somebody pays for that. So think about what kind of level of public speaking you have to reach and where you're currently at. And I'll give you a moment. Thinking about Magda's example, where do you think, what kind of level of competence should she reach if she wants to be in an international company, board? Probably a four, invited locally, because that means her industry, her country sees her as an expert in that area, and that she's good at it, and that she's visible. Now, how can you improve public speaking? By saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely true. How can we generate public speaking opportunities? To do it for free. <laughs> exactly. Start for free. Um, you can join Toastmasters. TEDx, find opportunities, volunteer to go to conferences as a speaker. Again, Udemy, Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, they also have um, good material in that area. So okay, before I start out in the public, maybe I look at some techniques. Um, you can hire a coach that helps you, especially if you're frightened. The, the thing with public speaking is 
that's the thing that influences career success the most, but it's also the thing that people are most terrified of. When it comes to fear, it's almost as close to the fear of losing somebody close. Good. Written communication. Um, here we said level one would be non-consistent, two professional, three skillful, four publishes articles, five has written a book. Now, with the written communication, there is this assumption, okay, I have a laptop, I write hundreds of emails every day, of course it's professional. But remember my examples, caps lock writing and then being a little bit nasty over email. <laughs> so sometimes it's good to get feedback on the written communication. Do people like reading your emails? Do they think about the target group? Uh, most would probably be at a professional level or think they're on a professional level, but they're non-consistent. And now think about where, because not every role, not every career step that you want to achieve will require to be everywhere between four and five. Some, it will be enough to be at the level three, but it's good to know where you want to get and where you, where you are right now. So in terms of uh, Magda's pretend goal, where do you think she should be? At least yeah. skillful, ideally, probably even articles, publishing articles, even if it's only articles on LinkedIn. But that will then create. It's not expert resistance. Say again. It's not expert resistance. What do you mean? If it's on LinkedIn. For sure. Well, what about if it's articles on sales techniques and. 5,000 people per week read it. So you gotta start somewhere. And that is a good way to start because usually once they get noticed and now the dynamics is a little bit different, once, uh, we'll see it in a bit, once you get noticed, you will then be invited by the proper media to then write other articles that are even paid for. Good. Yes. Or what? About technology, about the technique, not for the sales. Because sales is my goal, it's uh, not important. It depends on your target group. Okay. Whatever is relevant to them. If your target <coughs> group is salespeople who want to work with you, for example, then you write about one thing. If it's about, uh, if your target groups are decision makers, then you write for them. So when writing, the, that's where the skillful comes in, or the articles think about who are you writing for. Is it proper English? Because sometimes you can be at a level, for example, if I said, oh, for example, with me in English, I can definitely write articles. Polish, without a proofreader, no way. So the different, then you also can think about written communication in your own language, maybe you need to assess it also in the other language and get some additional training there. Good. Next, online presence. My favorite. How would you define online presence? Like the There's the duck duck and go go, <laughs> I know. But the search results usually Google and Bing. And whatever comes out here, that's the online presence. And when it comes to online presence, we look at three criteria. So number of contacts. <coughs> professionalism, level of professionalism, and 
visibility. Visibility is defined how easy is it to find something about you. Professionalism is about, this is the most complex criteria, quality of photo, articles, are you quoted, how many mistakes are there, etc, etc. So in terms of online presence, the way and my recommendation, Google yourself, but not only your name, your name. Let's try that. How about people who change their name? They have a problem. Or not, <laughs> depends. <laughs> so, do we have a volunteer? No volunteers? Could be me. Good. Yeah? UFN. UFN. Ale Bartłomiej? Nazwisko? Ok. So. At first sight we see it's very consistent. Engineer, probably smart, <laughs> mathematics. It, it's a first sight. It's first impression. It's all in the same thing, but we're there, and these are the things that we're sometimes not aware of. This is just the first step. Um, I had a client who was a lawyer. When you Googled his name, in the, ser in the second search results was his Facebook profile, <coughs> which he forgot to block, and there he liked a video of Girls in bikinis boxing. I wouldn't want to talk to a lawyer like that. Now, and those are the little things that influence whether a client gets in touch with us, whether a recruiter gets in touch with us. I had another client, a CEO, who, because um, one thing is Googling your name. That's easy. Then we can sometimes boil it down and add the parentheses. Then we should, but we won't do that yet, we will not do that in public, add his telephone number and Google the telephone number. Very often we forget that there are apartment like sales or rental ads where we use our private or business telephone number. Sometimes we forget that there is something associated with our private email address. And one of my clients forgot, well, it's not that he forgot, he was not aware that his private email address that he used in the CV was attached to the username of his deactivated dating profile where he explicitly explained his sexual preferences. And it comes down to awareness. Wasn't, there wasn't even a mistake, he didn't know. So those are the things if you want to do something about your online presence, Google yourself but also use the parenthesis with your telephone number, private, business, email address, private email address, business email address, and make sure that you know what others find when they look for your information. This is something that has become more and more important, especially at sea level, because candidates, it's not, a, it's not a criminal background check, but just a step before that, because companies want to make sure they know who they're hiring and what's findable on the internet on them. Thank you for volunteering. You're, You're very brave. <laughs> Good. Reputation. Some of you already said that. Who should know you? Not what do they say, but who should know you? So, the reputation. Is it enough that your team knows you? Should, then, should you be known within the company? Should you be known within your industry? Should you be known outside your industry but within your country or should you be known within obviously your target group internationally? So in your case Magda with your pretend, uh, pretend um, uh, goal, what would you say? Where do we need to get in terms of reputation? What would you say? Three, Three is enough. Now question, do the CEOs in her industry know about her? If not, 
then it's probably that she's not within her company, but not yet within her industry. By how do we increase our reputation? Could be very targeted recommendations. Public, yes. Public speaking as well. Public speaking. I'll call it social media. For example, LinkedIn articles, <laughs> Twitter, if it's used in your industry. Everything has to do with your target group. If you're nobody in, in your industry reads Twitter, then that's not something you need to be doing. Make sense? Good, so now look at your goals. Where are you now? Where should you be? And where's the discrepancy? Monica, I would really like to know what we're now thinking, because she's seemed like, oh my god. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Isn't that a good start into the new year? <laughs> it's sometimes hard to assess. <laughs> yeah. Let's continue. One we call the appearance, but it's not only appearance, it's not just about how we dress, but it's about the software we run. If the CEO of Europe invites you to lunch, do we know where to place the different forks and the wine glass and the water glass? And it's about how we greet the receptionist. Sometimes in some recruitment processes, the receptionist has a say in whether somebody should be hired or not. And it seems to be a myth, but it's not a myth, it's actually true. Um, so appearance savoir, savoir vivre, is it non-consistent, is it correct, is it purposeful, is it well-dressed or well-developed? Or is it even at the level that you say, oh, I want to be like that person? Remember CEO number one? Style to be imitated, definitely. Yes, but this also can, be, can work the other way. Of course. So depending on the industry. Depending Everything on the depends industry. on the target group. I yes. I had a case myself that I went for an interview abroad and I was dressed like here. And then the entire selection committee was in sweats. And it was a <laughs> development bank. And yes. I knew the moment I entered, by the way, they look at me that I'm up. Mm -hmm. Nothing has. Yes, <laughs> that's true. That's why here the purposeful is important. You were probably correct, but it wasn't purposeful because you, we didn't, you didn't think about the target group or you didn't know how they would be dressed. I knew these people, but I knew them from conferences and they were dressed differently. But ah. the interview, they come like, so for Magda, where would we say that she would have to be in terms of appearance? Three to four, probably. Most probably. And again, this is not about overdoing it or saying, oh, everybody has to be four or five and and it's also one of the things I've learned, it's not about buying the most expensive things, it's just being purposeful and knowing what fits, what doesn't fit, for example. How can you improve appearance or and or savoir vivre ideas? Read about it. Read about it. Watch some good examples. <laughs> Go to her hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, listen to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's mostly about your, your own habits around that. Mm -hmm. Improve habits around that. Control your temper. <laughs> Unless you need the temper for the job. Uh, my recommend, uh, when in terms of reading, I like one person. I hope I have not misspelled her, Dorota Szczesniak-Koszorek. Yes. Um, I 
I liked her stuff because it's not written in the guru way and I'm, I'm sure you know what I mean. There are a lot of stylists and uh, I react alert, allergically to them. Um, but with her, she's very, I like her. That is expert level, calm style. She resonates with me. Um, so you can read, and she's also somebody who coaches people on that. Um, not a celebrity kind of thing, just very competent. She's my favorite. Good. And it's now the last one. You already also said it network. Goes a little bit in line with reputation, but the reputation should be bigger than your network. Uh, network within your team, within the company, within the industry, within the country, or internationally. Um, so we're, the on the slide. Is there? Uh, appear on the network. Mm -hmm. On the slide there is, yes. Thank you so much. Um, her network would have to be where? International. I think for her, for her goal, within the, the industry would be enough. And it has to be within internationally, definitely. So it, it depends on, on the goal and the target group, yes. So again, look at yours. Where are you currently at? Where should you be? And how can you improve your network? Start networking. at events do you know it's not here on your cell phones when you go onto linkedin and switch on linkedin <coughs> nearby and if everybody does that you will see each other and you can connect to each other and boom 20 new people 35 for example so this is Network, obviously that would then just be an increase in number, doesn't mean that you have spoken to everybody. So if somebody asked me before, well, how do you increase my network? For example, LinkedIn, if somebody sends me an invitation, I have never spoken to them, do I add them yes or no? What would you say? Would you add somebody who you don't know to your LinkedIn profile, yes or no? What does it depend on, Leszek? Whatever it's uh, in the area of my interest, I'd say. If it's Bill Gates. Uh, my yeah. industry, <laughs> uh, maybe some stakeholders mm -hmm. or potential stakeholders. Mm -hmm. But Good. not everybody. Yes. I have just received an invitation from the military person from, the, from Canada. Mm -hmm. They know how it's, uh, uh, it's, I don't know how to, how to pronounce it. It's a great poruchny. Lieutenant? Yes, yeah, yeah. And so, <laughs> just, I don't know how it works because I, I look at the profile, it's completely nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the way to go about it. I know people, I know people who would say, I add everybody, and who will recommend to add everybody. This is strategy number one. Strategy number two says, I will only add people who I have spoken to personally or who I've had an email exchange with. And it is strategy number two. And that the third one is that says, maybe or it depends. And the flash check strategy, who said, where you add a filter. If it's potentially interesting, potential employee, potential client, potential peer, then yes, otherwise no. And depending on what your goal is, I would then recommend one of those three strategies. If someone from, from the industry you don't know and uh, invite you, for example, mm -hmm. on the LinkedIn. Exactly. So if, for example, Magda knows she needs to build her network in the industry, because also you have to think every connection is a follower and is a reader, has an audience. Um, so again, look at yours, where you're at, where you should be, and that's it. 
um, to finish off what I'd like you to do for a minute. Think about what you've learned today and three things that you will start doing and or will do and by when. For example, update my photo on LinkedIn or get a personalized link on LinkedIn or invite all my company peers to my LinkedIn profile or find public speaking engagements, anything, but choose three things. Don't make a to-do list of 10. Don't get depressed and frustrated like Monica, <coughs> like, oh my God, so many things. Just choose three things that you wanna do, okay? I'll give you a minute, write down these things, because I want you to walk out with something concrete from here today. So pick for these things, put a deadline to it. Thank you so much for coming today. Hi, thank you very much for watching. If you find our content interesting, valuable or insightful, please click subscribe for more videos. And if you happen to be with this business school, an alumni, student or on the faculty side and we're not yet cooperating, get in touch.